Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this timely and important conversation about the criminal justice system, policing, and race. My name is Akuna Cook, and I'm a senior fellow at Third Way. I'm thrilled to have two guests with us this afternoon that can help us understand this moment and the conversation that is literally happening in the streets with activists, policymakers, and citizens about how we reimagine policing and public safety so that we can finally stop adding to the long list of men and women like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Richard Brooks. Before I introduce our two guests, a bit of housekeeping. I'll kick off the discussion with questions for our guests and then open it up to Q&A. You can ask questions at any time during this uh, event by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. So first, it's an honor to have James Foreman Jr. Uh, James was actually my constitutional law professor at Yale Law School, where he is the J. Skelly Wright Professor of Law. He's also the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America. After clerking for Sandra Day O'Connor, James is an attorney with the DC Public Defender Service, after which he started the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, an alternative school for school dropouts and youth who had previously been arrested. He teaches and writes in the areas of criminal procedure and criminal law policy, constitutional law, juvenile justice, education law, and policing, with a particular interest in schools, prisons, policing, and how those institutions are affected by race and class. I'm also thrilled to have with us Roy L. Austin. Roy was Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Obama administration. He began his career at the Justice Department investigating uh, hate crimes and police brutality cases around the country. He's worked on cases involving the New Orleans Police Department, Missoula Law Enforcement, and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he's also served as the White House on the White House Domestic Policy Council as Deputy Assistant to President Obama for the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice, and Opportunity. In this position, he co-authored a report on big data and civil rights, worked with the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, and helped develop the Police Data Initiative. He's worked on the expansion of re-entry assistance and was a member of President Obama's My Brother's Keeper Task Force. Thank you to you both for joining us today. Um, James, I wanna start with you. Uh, your book, Locking Up Our Own, explores so many of the themes that I think are just really important for policymakers and advocates and, and, and activists uh, to think about at this moment. Um, you really focus a lot on unintended policy consequences, uh, and you talk about how Black political leaders were, if not the driving force, certainly the strongest supporters of tough on crime initiatives like opposing the decriminalization of marijuana, mandatory minimums, pretextual stops, longer and longer prison sentences, asset forfeitures, all of these initiatives that have now added up to the system we have today with all of the racial disparities. As you're observing this moment and thinking about the movement, for example, to defund the police and the proposals we see coming out of Congress from Republicans and Democrats, how are you thinking about possible reforms? And are there any unintended consequences that you think we should all be tuned into? Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you and with Roy, um, whose work I've admired uh, for so long. Um, one, just I would say just maybe slight co correction to the characterization of my book. I'm not saying that African American leaders were the strongest. Uh, I just meant really what I was trying to do in that book was explore the positions that black officials took. And one, uh, one of the ways um, that they express their views was by supporting some of these stuff on crime. But I don't want to minimize the role that other people, that the federal government, that Ronald Reagan, that Richard Nixon, that there were many, many forces, the media uh, that were driving what happened over the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. And Black political leaders were part of that story, but definitely not, um, I would say, the, the, the strongest voices. But to answer your question directly, you know, when I think about the moment that we're in now and I compare it to the history, uh, I think about um, somebody like D David Clark, who was a Washington DC city council member. 
he was very progressive. He was a like white political leader actually at a time when the city, almost all its elected officials were black. And he was opposed to the drug war. And he fought for marijuana decriminalization. But in the early 1980s, when he was the chair of the city council, heroin hit Washington DC incredibly hard again. And he and his colleagues were deluged with letters from citizens, all decrying heroin addicts occupying public space, leaving dirty syringes in alleys, gathering and, and falling asleep on sweet street corners and park benches. And what did David Clark do when he received all of those letters? He forwarded them to the head of the re of re relevant government agency and said, please take action, please take action. And so here's the question. Who did David Clark forward those letters to? Remember, the problem was heroin addicts in public space. Did he forward them to the Department of Mental Health, Addiction Services, Drug Treatment and Rehabilitation? No. He forwarded them to the police chief. Because like so many people in this country over the last 50 years and still today, he thought of the problem of heroin addicts in public space as a problem that we should send a police officer to respond to. And of course, that was the agency that had enough funding so that there were officers available to respond. The Department of Mental Health, had he forwarded the letter there, would have said, well, we have a six month waiting list, but we're not sending a counselor out to the corner this afternoon, right? So this is a story about how our imaginations have been cramped and also how the policy choices that we have made that reinforce that limited imagination. Because you can dream all you want about having an alternative response to a heroin addiction instead of policing, but if you don't have the funding to make that possible, you're not gonna be able to get it done. So when I think about this moment and the implications for this moment, for me, the number one takeaway that I have is that as much as we focus on what we're taking away from police or what we're taking away from prisons or what we're taking away from prosecutors when we wanna shrink mass incarceration, it is crucial that we get into the hard work of building from the ground up the alternatives. What else are we going to do instead? Mm. Because I'm going to guarantee you this. If we, if we shrink the police, but we don't build an alternative structure in their place, then as soon as crime starts to rise, all of these efforts that have been made will go by the wayside and they will have, it will happen overnight. And we'll, we will see a reaction that makes the 94 crime bill and the crack laws of the 80s look like child's play. And that's hard work building those alternatives. It's not easy to construct an alternative to a policing system and to a prison system, but it's our obligation to do so. That's a fantastic point. And, and thank you for the clarification on, on your book. Um, I think it's, I think that the point you just made uh, is critical because we are in this pandemic environment where we're seeing state and local uh, budgets being cut. And so you might be seeing cuts to police budgets that are tied to not having funding because of the pandemic, but not seeing the requisite you know, increases in investments elsewhere. And so, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask both of you and, and Roy, I'd love to jump in for you to jump in here is as we think about reforms and as we think about what may eventually be rising crime rates in places um, like Chicago and like Detroit, because we are in the middle of a pandemic and people are out of work and all of the root causes of crime, like those things are still exist and maybe even worse now. How do we avoid a scenario where the reforms that are necessary don't actually take place and what would you prioritize in terms of reform? So thank you very much, Akuna. And uh, I do want to remind you that, that James is no longer your professor. So you're allowed to say when his stuff doesn't make any sense. He, he doesn't have any control over you or your grades anymore. Um, <laughs> but sadly, uh, at least at the first question, James was 100% correct. Um, um, and I, I want to take it to um, something that we just saw. So there's been uh, end of the Obama administration into the, the, the new administration there's been this big push on reentry and giving people second chances. And it's been something that's been very bipartisan. 
But what hasn't happened is the funding or the or what it looks like to actually help a person who is reentering. People aren't talking about that. And so now you're getting that blowback in certain states. I know California has seen some blowback to it because people are saying, well, you know, if people are getting released and they're, they're committing crimes. It's like, well, okay, well, people commit crimes whether they're released or not, but you also haven't built any infrastructure for the people who are being released. And you have to build that infrastructure if you're going to have success. You can't just have uh, be Johnny one note here and just say, we're gonna end the current system. Exactly what James just said is you have to create a system on, on the other end. Uh, as far as you know, where we can very quickly have some success in this space or where we can do things, um, I met James actually, he was a PBS. I was a special at the US Attorney's Office coming from the Civil Rights Division. And we met because of an amazing program that James and, and his partner, uh, Dave Domenici, uh, put together um, to help young people. And I think that's actually where we can always start is with young people. We can completely change the juvenile justice system and have enormous support for it and rely on the fact that these young people who are getting into some trouble right now are not going to be getting in trouble as, as adults. Um, get them out of incarceration, get them the training that they need to succeed, get them the education and it's a smaller population that we could work with very, very quickly uh, and have dramatic results with. Um, so, you know, that's an, that to me is, is, is low hanging fruit, um, not to use a, a, a horrible uh, description of what we're dealing with in the criminal justice system. Um, but um, I think that's a place where we can actually have um, some quick success. I think we can also have some quick success just because the police have for decades said, don't make us the people who have to deal with mental health problems. If we just, if we hire a bunch of social workers, let them be on uh, kind of the first to go in on a lot of these things, I think we'll have enormous success there as well on the crisis intervention pieces. Um, one of the things that you say um, in your book, you, uh, there's a quote that I have here. Um, you know, you said, what if we came to see that justice requires accountability, but not vengeance? What if we came to understand that equal protection under the law, including equal protection for black victims too long denied it, doesn't have to mean the harshest available punishment? What if we endeavored to make the lives of black victims matter without policies that lead to the mass incarceration of black defendants? What if we strove for compassion, for mercy, forgiveness? And what if we did this for everybody, including people who have harmed others? I thought about that and thought about the great sort of culture shift and narrative shift that has to happen for that to, you know, for us to get to that place. Because as soon as people said to fund the police, there was a, a bit of a, you know, sort of like this uh, outcry of what does that even look like? And it, and it sounds like what you are putting forward, and at least in this quote, is a vision. And so have you, have you just talk a little bit about what you think it would require for get us to get to a place where we truly have reimagined what crime and punishment looks like? So it would require us to do a lot of things, including the things that, that Roy mentioned and many more. And so I guess I wanna say at the outset, I wanna say two things. One, uh, to get to that vision that I just described in the pages that you, in the page you cited, would require us to do you know, hundreds of things. Having said that, Roy is exactly right that the only way we're gonna do 100 things is if we start with one today, mm -hmm. and then we start with the second tomorrow. And so we need to, I think, always be operating on two planes. One is to have this vision, this idealistic vision. It should be ide full of ideals. That's how I think of idealistic vision of where we want to go and an understanding that getting there, that this system was built over 50 years of mass incarceration, but you can go back to hundreds of years, back to Jim Crow and slavery, and it's going to take a long time to dismantle and it's going to be piece by piece. And so every piece matters. So if there's an activist out there that's working on one thing, that's working on changing union contracts, that's working on trying to pass more progressive or aggressive use of force policies, that's trying to build an alternative juvenile program, that's trying to invest in credible messengers, people who will uh, be from the community who will go and interrupt violence um, before it happens. 
all of those things, teachers, educators, nurses, all of those things are part of the vision that I'm talking about, the vision that we need to build this alternative system. So everybody should know that they have a piece of it. Um, I think um, one thing that I would really like us to give more attention to, and that I'm trying to reference in that quote, is that, you know, when, when if you give a hypothetical in a, you know, criminal law class, let's say, and, and, and it's a, a sentencing, you know, somebody did this and should, what should the sentence be? I have found over the years that when I really push my students, what they want, what they actually are, say they want, and the reason if you push them to ju that they justify their sentence is not that the, they want the person necessarily to be punished, but they want the person to be held accountable. And we have, in this country, we have suggested that those are the same thing, that the only way you get accountability is with prison. Right? And that's one of the reasons why we've supported prison building to the extent that we have. And so there are, pro you know, Roy mentioned a program, I'll mention one, Common Justice in Brooklyn, but there are, others ex there are other examples that do similar work around the country. These are grassroots community-based organizations that put the person who committed harm, including violent crimes, including robbery, including assault, including in some cases murder, put them in relationship with the people that they have harmed. And that sometimes takes years. It's, you know, Danielle Sered, the founder of Common Justice, talks about saying sorry, but she also talks about doing sorry. You have to show the ways in which you are sorry. And that can be, you know, much more creative than we, when we think of, you know, community service. The real question, though, is a group of people coming together and saying, not what crime was committed, who committed it, and what should the punishment be? But instead, what harm was done? Who did the harm? And how can we collectively redress that harm? And I think that if we change our mindset to ask those questions, some, the outcome will more often, in many cases that we currently use prison, we will start to think of other ways of redressing harm. Um, Roy, in your years of doing this work, what do you think are the biggest barriers to reform? We talked a little bit about police unions, and, and, and I think now we're all sort of much more conscious about the role um, that unions play. Um, but what are some of the, including unions, but what are some of the other barriers you think um, that activists and policymakers need to be aware, aware of and will need to um, wrestle with in making these reforms? Yeah, so, um, and, and let me just add on common justice. You also have impact justice in San Francisco with Sujatha uh, Buglia, I think is her last name, doing uh, fantastic work in the restorative justice space as well. Um, the, if I were to put it in, in one word, it's complacency. Mm. We have accepted as a society, number one, that police officers can kill more than a thousand people every single year. Since we've been collecting data every single year, more than, more than a thousand people are killed by police. We've accepted our homicide rate as what it is. We've accepted our violent crime rate as what it is. And we accept, not only do we accept this stuff, but then we go around touting that we have the greatest criminal justice system in the world. And yet we have the greatest because we have the most. Um, we have the most courts, we have the most people incarcerated, we have the most homicides, we have, that's not a great system. And so the problem is that we keep doing the same thing over and over again. This is, you know, the definition of insanity. And we're not getting significantly better results. You know, we talk about a little dip in the crime rate. We talk about a little dip here. It's, it, we're, we're past that now. We, we need a fundamental remaking of our criminal justice system to both enhance public safety and to be more fair to, to our citizens. And I think it is that level of complacency that has allowed someone like the police unions to kind of fill that void with scare tactics of your crime is going to go massively up if we don't, if, if you hold officers accountable. Well, we've seen that that's not true. We've had places where we put in consent decrees where officers were held accountable. And we saw that the, the number of shootings went down dramatically. 
um, by, by police officers. Okay, so th there's a scare tactic, but, but it, again, we all wrap ourselves in this, in this blanket of, if we lock people up, we're gonna be safer. But we now have decades of evidence that that's just not true at all. And we just accept the horrible numbers that we have. And so it's, it's general complacency and it's an unwillingness to, to look at something completely new. And I think what I've seen over the past three, four weeks is a greater shift in public opinion than I saw in the prior 25 years. And a willingness to look at these problems and these issues at a way that they've never been looked at before. And I'm extremely excited um, by, again, this is young people leading the way because, you know, I was sitting there nibbling at the edges for years at, oh, you know, maybe we can uh, have another reentry program. Okay, that's nibbling at the edges. When we fundamentally remake, what, you know, we're talking about whether or not police officers should, should engage in traffic stops. That's a huge, huge deal. And one that I, I never even really thought about before and need to. Yeah. Yeah. You recently said that in this moment, you know, you said, I see the end of the death penalty. I see the significant removal of jail for low level offenses. I see the potential investment and serious investment in majority minority spaces. I see a complete remaking of the role of the prosecutor. I think it's all on the table now. Talk a little bit about how you see remaking the role of the prosecutor and a little bit about how that fits into this picture. Look, we, we, we're seeing Kim Gardner, Kim Fox, Larry Krasner, uh, Chesa um, um, in San Francisco. Uh, we are seeing prosecutors for the first time not talking about how long a sentence they got for somebody. We are seeing prosecutors for the first time talk about um, why are we locking up people for low level offenses? Why do we have a bail system at all? It's a stupid system. DC got rid of it. I mean, why, why are we linking a, a person's income to whether or not they should be re released from jail or not? And so there, there are about, there are a few dozen of, of these and, and uh, organizations like Fair and Just Prosecution, the Institute for the Innovation of Prosecution, and then uh, Adam Foss's organization have, 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 have been really talking about this. And what it is, is it's, it's, it's prosecutors who realize that, that the old way is not working. Again, we can just keep locking up people. We can take parents away from their kids and then be like, oh, that kid has, has problems. It's like, that's, that's silly, it's stupid, and it's just fundamentally unfair. So we gotta look at what you know, Tracy Mears and Tom Tyler's work on procedural justice. All of these people realize that black people and brown people are getting convicted and put in jail for the crimes that white people are committing. And we have to fundamentally change it. And we need prosecutors who are actually, I think, more powerful than police, more powerful than judges, the most powerful people in the system. And if we can get more reform-minded prosecutors out there, they're going to force a change. And they're holding police officers accountable in ways that we haven't seen before. Yeah. James, so one of the, one of the things you bring up in your book um, is a classified in the Black community. And it's related to one of the questions we got from the audience about who should be at the table, uh, you know, whose voices should be cent centered as we talk about reform. You know, so you talk about how a lot of, um, you know, certainly the, the, the white uh, policymakers, but a lot of the Black policymakers and all Black leaders were making policies that didn't really, probably weren't going to touch them because a lot of these criminal justice and um, ideas were going to be playing out in poor black neighborhoods, which doesn't reflect who's typically in power. So do you think that that dynamic is changing? And if not, how do we make sure that as we're in this moment where we're reimagining these possibilities that the right people are at the table and who do you think needs to be part of the conversation? So I think it's changing somewhat. Um, and I think that the protests on the streets in particular are forcing is a challenge to politicians of all stripes and all races, but including to the black political, political class, um, right? Because they're being challenged and people saying, you know, I don't know that the answers that you've been giving, and I, you know, your imagination may have become too constrained. You may have, you may have, you know, Roy talked about nibbling at the edges. So I think this is a real thing that I would ask everybody to be very cautious of. When you are, hearing from somebody who's been working in this space for 20 years, right? Like myself and like Roy, 
I want, before they get to speak, I want to make sure that you hear them say some acknowledgement that what we've been trying has not been up to the task, right? And Roy, he put it out there. He said, I've been nibbling at the edges and we need to do more. And I'll say the same thing. I think that some of the, even if you look at my book, some of the things that I thought were, were, would have been significant now look like mild and not, not up to the moment. And so if somebody doesn't acknowledge that, if somebody has been doing this for work for a while and they come back and tell you that, well, we need to do exactly the thing that I said 20 years ago and 10 years ago, then I'm immediately gonna be suspicious of that person. Um, so I'll say that. On the point of who should be at the table, one thing that has changed in the last few years is there are more and more people, sometimes people refer to folks as formerly incarcerated or justice involved families, people that have had direct experience with the system, whatever terminology you wanna use, is that people that have seen this system from the inside, I teach a class in the Connecticut prison every semester on the, on, on the, on the system. And I can tell you that the wisdom and the insight and the knowledge that my incarcerated students bring to the conversation blows away what the Yale students have to say. And, you know, no offense, Akuna, to the, you know, brilliant <laughs> graduates <laughs> of your alma mater. Um, but so that's the reality, right? But those voices have been systematically devalued, have been stigmatized. You know, back in the 90s, I remember this at PBS, back in the 90s, the notion that somebody who themselves had been arrested and convicted would go down to the city council to testify about reform legislation. It was like nobody was even willing to try it because they would say, oh, well, as soon as they show up, then they're going to be delegitimized because people are going to just say, why are you coming here to testify? You were selling drugs. You shot somebody, right? Now, today, there is a change. But if any advocate comes before your organization or before your city council, and they're purporting to speak on behalf of, but they're not also doing the work to build up within their staff, spokespeople and leaders who themselves have been arrested, convicted, and incarcerated, then I'm gonna ask hard questions about that person as well. So this is the way I think we can begin to change whose voices are getting elevated in these conversations. And to follow up on that, Roy, do you think that the coalitions for reform should include law enforcement representatives, including unions, or do you think that they're just too much of a barrier to reform? So first of all, if James taught at a real law school, he would understand a lot of these problems a lot better. Um, unfortunately, the, the policy school that he teaches at doesn't you know, deal with real life as often as it should. Um, look, I think they have to be. I think they have to be. Police officers are uh, human beings with the same human faults and, 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 and goodness that everyone else has. And if you, if you eliminate anyone from the conversation, you're never going to reach those people. And I think it's, it's, it's important, just as James was talking about with the formerly incarcerated, it is, there are incredibly smart people who have been incarcerated. The vast majority of them are incredibly smart people. And it's often a set of circumstances that has led them to where they are, and they can tell you more about that than anyone else can tell you. They have to be given voice. Police officers know what's happening on the street. They know why it is they do the things they do. They know which fellow officers are the biggest problems. They know what is wrong with the culture. They know it, they're afraid to say it oftentimes. But you have fantastic chiefs like Ron Davis, who was in East Palo Alto, who led the task force on 21st century policing. Chuck Ramsey, who was in Philadelphia, who uh, led the Philadelphia police, the DC police. Scott Thompson, who was in Camden. Now, do they all, like James and, and me, need to be pushed further than we've ever been before? Absolutely. But at the same time, you know from working with these people that their, their heart, their desire to do well is in the right place. They're smart. They understand how the system currently works. And if you understand how the system currently works, you're in a better position to help uh, help change that system as long as you're not too hard-headed to allow young people with, with greater imaginations to throw in um, other ideas. But they, they need to be at the table, otherwise it will never be accepted. And it's going to be hard. And there's some who will just continue to posture, 
but you got to invite them to the table. You got to make them part of the solution. And look, part of the solution is some of them may end up without jobs at the end of the day. But if we have fewer people in law enforcement and more people who are healthy in this community, in this, in this society, we're in a much, much better place. Yeah. I want to turn to politics a bit. Roy, you said that the last two weeks have transformed police politics within a Democratic Party in ways that you didn't imagine possible. Um, you know, we're obviously in the middle of, an, uh, of a very, very important election. And this question, I guess, is really for both of you. How do you think that the conversation and what's politically possible is changing? And how do you think that Black voters, who are obviously going to be uh, uh, an important part of whatever the outcome is going to be, how do you think that um, basically election, you know, candidates can really engage them effectively on the topic of criminal justice and policing reform. I mean, when is the last time that you thought that any politician running for any office at all would say, I'm running on a platform of prosecuting more police officers? I mean, it, it was absolutely, there's never a time that I thought that, but enhancing 242, um, uh, limiting, like putting hard, uh, limiting qualified immunity. And these are topics that are, at least in the Democratic Party right now, absolutely the baseline of where people need to be. And so it is a complete transformation of, of politics to, to have Joe Biden talking about removing the death penalty. I mean, it's not even a question anymore that a, a Democratic administration will get rid of the death penalty on the federal side. It, it's, it's, it's where we are. For the Republican side, for a Republican president to be touting a, an albeit very weak criminal justice reform bill, I mean, that in and of itself was, was stunning to me. And now they're actually putting out proposals that will impact policing. Now, they're weak proposals, but even the fact that they will touch what has largely been a third rail in politics tells me how far we've shifted politically uh, on all of these criminal justice issues including and especially policing, because they realize they can either be on this train toward reform or they can get run over by this train toward reform. You don't have every city in the country having protests, completely all white communities having protests, the entire world having protests if something isn't going to change. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. And I, I share Roy's sense of Kind of enthusiasm for, for the moment uh, that we're in. You know, I don't know, none of us uh, in this conversation know what it was like to be alive in, in the civil rights movement in the 1960s um, and what that, you know, what that energy felt like and what the possibilities for change uh, uh, seem like. But it feels to me, I don't know if it's going to be sustained, but it does feel to me like maybe what that felt like. Uh, in terms of um, young people uh, leading and a multiracial coalition coming together and people saying things that, again, as we've talked about in this call, would have been unimaginable even three months ago and shifting the conversation that rapidly and that radically, I think uh, is, is, is thrilling in its sense of possibility. That doesn't mean, again, we don't know where it's going to go. Um, and a lot of this is going to be determined by whether the energy um, of organizers and the energy of young people is able to persist through all of the challenges, COVID, elections, and otherwise. But for me, you know, Roy talked about at the federal level, um, and my focus has always been at the state um, and the city and at the local level. And so I just want to say, you know, that's where, you know, we know 88% of our police officers 85% of incarcerated men and women are at a state, county, or local level. That's where these policies, one of the places where these policies play out. If you care about the contract or the use of force policies or the, or the accountability for police officers in your community, then the place you need to be is at the city hall and at the county council. That's your mayor and your, your county council that are determining much of that or at the state legislature. And in many cases, in many cases, it has been Democratic 
mayors that, that have negotiated these same contracts. Nobody's even been asking the question. The legal counsel passes it over. They sign it. Are they paying attention to what the arbitration rules are? No. Even in a city like Washington, D.C., which at the local level has had progressive leadership, majority black city, the police department, every year, my friends that work in D.C. government tell me every year, there's a conversation about reducing the size of the Metropolitan Police Department. And there'll be proposals and it'll be in the budget and the number's gonna go down from 4,000 to 3,200 or whatever year to year. And then at the end of the day, when it all comes out, somebody got to somebody and the, it is unchanged. Crime goes down, police force doesn't shrink, it gets bigger. And these are happening in cities, and these are, and the good news to me for citizen activists out there and just regular people who care, is we can have more of an influence at the local level. We can have more of an influence on in what happens at the city council level than we can what happens in Washington, D.C. and Congress, although we have to fight there as well. Um, so I would really encourage people that care about this issue to get involved and get engaged locally. Yeah. A uh, somewhat uh, controversial question, but I think you guys can handle it. Should Joe Biden take as much heat as he's taking for the 94 crime bill when it had so much support from the black community at the time? <laughs> the answer is yes. Exactly. The answer has to be yes. It, the, you, you have to acknowledge that the crime bill had huge problems, whether or not, you, you know, it, and it's not saying that he was a bad person for thinking the way, you know, 90% of America thought at the time. But we, we need to acknowledge that it was wrong. It was wrong to create a system that locked up that many people for that long with no scientific basis. And now we have the evidence of the harms that it did in our desire to completely reverse um, so many of the things. So look, we have to push our political leaders. We have to. And I think his platform right now is dramatically better because people have said, we got to do better. Um, so look, I, look, I should be taking heat for some of the things I did as a prosecutor 20 years ago. Okay. I, I think James kind of acknowledged that Maybe some of the things he did as a public defender 20 years ago were not exactly where we should be right now. But now we have 20 plus years of evidence that we need to do better. Mm. Let's figure out what that better is. Yeah, to me, to just respond to your question, Kuni, it, de it depends on what you mean by heat. I mean, this is what I would love to hear a politician say about the 94 crime bill or any kind of similar thing, right? First, give context. Explain to people what the murder rate looked like. Explain to people that Eric Holder was giving speeches on Martin Luther King Day saying the greatest threat to Black America today is the fact that we can't be safe when we walk outside on the streets of Washington, D.C., right? Black, black people, race men and race women, people that care deeply about upholding the future of our race, thought those things and believed those things and they were real. People were scared, right? And you need to start by saying that and say, look, in a country with a racist history and a long history of racist ideas, I and many other people bought into the notion that the best way to do something about that was to hire more police officers and to build more prisons. I thought that I was doing the right thing but I was wrong. I now see the consequences of those choices. And so now let me tell you about the things that are on my policy agenda to unwind that history and build a new future. That's all, that's all to me. And again, I'm not, this is probably the reason why I'm not a political, you know, advise people who are running for office. You know, I'm not, I'm not on Pod Save America giving that kind of advice. But that's what I would want to hear as a citizen, because to me, that's just real. And, it, and I, I, here's what I am certain of. That's a position that Black people will understand and respond to. 
Absolutely, because it's authentic. And also, we all have people in our family that were said the same thing. So if you have any doubts about whether it's real, all you have to do is go talk to your grandmother, your aunt, or whoever, and they'll be like, yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a great point because I think even now when folks started talking about defund the police, there was this sort of like, at least half my timeline was like, whoa, 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 what do you mean to fund the police? What are we going to do about, you know, crime? And then the other half was sort of like, oh, like, yeah, this makes sense. So I think that even within the Black community, that's an active debate. And we have to figure out a way to engage the, the community so that we are all sort of going, getting to where we all want to land, which is uh, a, a much more um, non-racist criminal justice system. Um, hey, I'm voting for James Foreman. I just got to tell you, I, 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 need to, I, I'm voting, <laughs> I don't know what he's running for, but he just gave the campaign speech that we need right now on criminal justice. That, that's exactly what we need to be saying. No, I'm going to record this and send it to the campaign. Like somebody needs to get these remarks into, into the speech. Um, you talk a little bit about uh, violent crime, and I want to just, you know, touch on that um, as we're starting to wrap up. Uh, you know, in the book you say it's 20% of, only 20% of prisoners are in for drug charges. Most are actually in for uh, robbery. And, but when we talk about, uh, you know, criminal justice reform, we tend to focus on nonviolent drug offenders. And I think that we, we happen to have a, a mutual friend who is an example of, of um, what happens to juvenile offenders who then have these, um, you know, this, this, uh, a, a, a violent charge on their record that kind of follows them around unnecessarily. And so just talk a little bit about it, because it seems to me like that's maybe the next step is rethinking how we think about, you know, crime, what, who, which criminals are worthy, et cetera, and, and how does violent crime and the conversation around that um, factor into all of this reform? Absolutely. And I will apologize in advance. My son just went outside to play basketball, which means that my, our dog might start barking. And I hope that doesn't happen. But if it does, that's, that's why. I think that the, the, the violent crime question really is, and what to do, how, both how to reduce levels of violent crime without resorting to more policing, and also how to respond to people who have harmed other people who have committed crimes that we define as violent. Those two questions, to me, are going to be, Lacuna, as you said, the next frontier, really the central question. Um, and it's hard, right? They're both hard, hard questions. Um, so just to focus, though, on the, how you put it, which is, well, how do we respond to meet people who have, uh, have committed those acts? You know, for me, the first thing that I try to resist is labels. I think that when we talk about person as a, a person as a violent criminal, two things happen in that conversation. Once we say that, and you hear politicians say that all the time, well, I'm not going to do anything about the violent criminals. You know, they, they're going to stay. There's two things that happen in that sentence. The first thing is that you defined somebody by the worst thing that they've done. Right. So now they're not a person who committed an act of violence, but their definition is they're a violent criminal. Right. The same way you might define somebody as a professor or uh, as a lawyer activist. Uh, so that's number one. But number two, the def that we don't even have a really a, a clear view of what it what violent crime is. So when I talk to people about violent crime. And I'll tell stories about my clients, right? And there's one in the book about a young man that committed an armed robbery. I remember I gave a, uh, uh, one of these, um, uh, uh, these talks where you couldn't use notes. It was like moth story hour. It wasn't exactly that, but I gave this, I told his story and I told the story as part of an argument for why we shouldn't just forever demonize people who commit, commit violent crimes. Now, this man robbed somebody at a bus stop with a knife. And at the end of the talk, a woman came up to me and she said, I appreciated your story, but I just wish you had talked about somebody who committed a violent crime. And I really had to, I, it was really struck me that the public definition and what the law counts as violent can be very, very different. Because she was talking about rape and murder. 
-hmm. Well, that's less than 5% uh, of the arrests of people who are arrested for violent crimes. So the overwhelming majority of crimes that the law considers violent crimes are aggravated assault, robbery, armed robbery, burglary. So then I want to start having a conversation. So for me, the label matters less than what happened, what, who is this person? What has happened in their life to contribute to this moment? What is the harm that they have done? How can we make the person who they harmed whole? And once you start having those conversations, even with victims of crime, you'll often hear them say things like, well, you're saying I have, if, if we give people a choice of prison or nothing, they always choose prison. But when you give victims of crime a choice that includes not just prison or nothing, but well, there's mental health treatment program, there's addiction services program, there's job training services, there's community service. Now, let's put that package together and ask even the victim of crime, what do you think is going to make you more whole and make our community more safe in the long term? And so that, to me, is how we have to break through this conversation. Well, I think that's a perfectly uh, good place for us to wrap up the conversation. Um, I want to thank both of you, Roy. Thank you, James. Thank you for making the time for this conversation. And also thank you for to our audience for all of your great questions. Um, we will be continuing this series uh, with another event. So take a look, uh, keep a look on your inbox for the next event in this series on how COVID-19 uh, and the criminal justice system is impacting Black communities. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.